Blog Talk Radio. Hello, this is Call Talk for Wednesday, August 4th, 2010. This is our 26th episode. Our topic today is workforce management. During the call, we invite you to ask questions via email at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com, on chat on our website, calltalk.tv, or call and ask to host your questions and interact with the show. The number to call in is 347-857-3117. Everyone who asks a question via email or phone on the show will receive a free copy of Bruce's book, Benchmarking at its Best, and one person will be chosen at random to win an in-depth reality check benchmarking report valued at $1,500. And now I'd like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thanks very much, Sean, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. I hope your summer is going well. Today's topic is on workforce management, and this definitely is an important topic since our one-minute survey of managers that we are have open right now, in fact, indicates that almost half of you are not particularly satisfied with your current workforce management systems. My guest today is Adam Sinkowski. Adam is based in Minnesota, where he is Senior Director of Workforce Management at United Health Group. There, he directs staffing and analytical strategies, and he creates models based on Airline C staffing methodologies, so you know he's got to be good. He also worked as an operations manager for marketing architects, and from 2000 to 2005, he was director of workforce operations at the Carlson Marketing and Carlson Leisure Travel Services Group, where he learned firsthand the value of networking with other parts of the organization to improve workforce planning. And I understand he also got a lot of good discount tickets to exotic places. Anyway, he's uh, previously a call center manager for Sylvan Pro Metric, where he opened and managed a multilingual call center in the Netherlands. Adam is in the process of finalizing a one-and-a-half-day course focused specifically on workforce management, which will include the secrets of Airline C and will be offered through the College of Call Center Excellence. Uh, you know the challenge with a topic like this is to offer takeaway ideas for people at many levels of sophistication. And, and I think we have just the person to do this. Adam, I'm delighted to welcome you back to, sh- to the show. And uh, how about it? Can you deliver the whole course in half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, Bruce, uh, let me say thanks uh, for having me on. It's great to be with you again. And uh, I think if, uh, if I actually scheduled a 12-hour course and all that content into our half-hour show today, uh, you'd have to question my, uh, my true workforce planning capabilities. <laughs> That's for sure. That would be quite the uh, the feat. And it, but hey, I'm not asking anything more than the marketing department asks for in most companies, right? You know, they say, right. "Hey, call center, there's a ton of calls coming your way, but we're not going to tell you about them. We'll just wait till afterwards to complain about your readiness to handle them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is definitely a frequent uh, refrain that we hear in workforce management. But uh, I think there are some really good ways to address that issue, and, and I hope we can cover some of those today in the show. Okay, I'm sure we will. And uh, we're looking forward to your insights as, uh, well as, as well as some of the results of the one-minute survey on workforce management that many of our listeners took. And by the way, the survey is still open for another two days. So those of you listening, if you'd like to uh, receive the results for free, uh, please get on and, and take that, uh, that survey. Uh, but first, uh, I know you're a big proponent, Adam, of understanding and honing the basics on workforce management. And, and what does this entail? Well, Bruce, I like to think of workforce management as an ongoing process that are, um, that are all linked together like links in a chain. And so uh, anyone that's worked with me knows the, the uh, frequent uh, mantra that I, I utter, which is gather, forecast, plan, optimize, analyze. And that really describes the process that I think of as workforce management and doing that over and over again. But the basics, the foundation, really starts with that gather phase of gathering data to do the rest of the process and to do it well. And if we don't have the data correct at the beginning, then we really are basing the rest of our practice on on misinformation rather than information, and that can lead to all kinds of problems, as as anyone could imagine. But I think the the basics include understanding what data sources are out there and ensuring Mm -hmm. that our practices are set up to get good, clean data. So what I mean by that is understanding our call, our call routing and how, how work is counted, and then also creating the right phone state practices within the operations to ensure that the data that we're getting from that information is leading us to the right conclusions. 
Mm, okay, those are great points. Uh, and I, I think this is one of those areas where really people at all levels of sophistication can stand to take a deeper look at the basics. Uh, and, and let's focus for a second on data sources. Uh, lots of people don't look at this perhaps closely enough, think that it's all going okay, uh, when it not necessarily it is. So what are your thoughts on that, Adam? Well, I think that's a really great point. Uh, I think when we look at the the way that most people start out, it probably goes towards the easiest to access data sources, which for most of us are our call management systems that provide reporting on what's going on in our ACD. But how often do we look for other places where we can get data that might give us uh, greater insight? For instance, going to our telecom carrier and getting a report there that would list how many calls get blocked or how many redial attempts do we have when we have abandons to understand something uh, like how many uh, – unique callers do we actually have? We could be missing some information at that point, um, as well as understanding maybe what takes place at an IVR level, if that's going to be the first thing that our customers encounter when they're trying to reach us. Um, I think those are places that some people um, might not think to go out and do on a routine basis. And when I say routine, because it can sound um, like heavy lifting, I'd say at least once a quarter to go out and get that information and put that against our call uh, management systems data to say, what am I learning? Am I, are there calls that maybe I wasn't originally counting because I'm starting at a layer below where the calls originate. Um, I think one other thing that I might look for as a place for information is with the marketing department um, and the sales department, what is being done to uh, spur the interest of our, uh, our callers? Why are they calling? And for instance, uh, did we send something in the mail and will that repeat itself over and over again? So I should include that in my forecast or maybe I should exclude some data in my next forecast because we had a unique event last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you've got a number of good nuggets in there, uh, Adam, and I think that the blocked call things is one thing where I see over and over again people don't have it or don't have it often enough from their telecom providers, and really, uh, the telecom provider will give it to them. They just need to ask for it. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and so that's a really important uh, point that you made there, I think, and those of you who, who aren't getting blocked calls on a regular basis, I think that's a, a takeaway right now to to make sure that you ask your telecom provider for the blocked calls and so that you can factor that in to uh, your analysis. And, um, yeah, uh, with regard to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, reaching out to other parts of the company in order to see what they're doing and making sure that they uh, let you know and you let them know what's going on, I think is extremely important. Uh, did you want to drill down on that a little bit more? Because I have a couple of stories on that, Adam. Sure, sure. I think that, you know, that's a very important topic. And I, one way that I've had success in the organizations I've worked with in facilitating that um, and creating the interest from other parts of the organization um, in participating and helping us really plan our business from a call center standpoint is to share with them information that maybe they don't think of uh, that can come from the call center. So it can be um, something that is very much a, a, a or I think I've heard this term before from you as a radial organization where we share information and, and, and collect information together, and that makes everybody um, more effective in their role. So from a marketing standpoint, we can help measure the response rate against a marketing campaign and help them understand maybe what are the most successful marketing campaigns that they're currently running, what's really driving up the response rates. Um, and in sharing that information, of course, we can ask them to then share information about what are future marketing efforts so we can plan to have resources available um, for those coming up. Mm. Yeah, and you know, the radial organization, uh, just as you have your mantra, that's one of mine, and that uh, we, we really need to build that in the call center sector because we tend to be isolated from uh, other parts of our organization. So if we reach out and try to connect, try to force them to communicate with us to begin with, They'll end up enjoying it, particularly if you make it nice for them, and uh, they'll see the rewards as well in terms of your ability to schedule for them, to be responsive for marketing or for other part, parts of the organization. Um, and, and at that point, they'll see you as more part of their team instead of as a, a barrier. So um, uh, really encourage people to reach out, uh, have that. If you have to, uh, the, every Monday morning or every Friday morning, 10-minute call, with those parts of the organization that right now are a thorn in your side uh, and turn them into one of the roses that you, you bring home every week. So I uh, really encourage you to do that. Reach out to those people, even if they're not reaching out to you, and they probably aren't, 
uh, and see if you can make them part of your team and become part of their team. Sounds good to me, Bruce. Okay, great, great. And um, one of the things that um, uh, I, I saw too is on the, uh, the the survey is that 25% of the organizations that replied have a separate team for workforce management. I think this might surprise a lot of people, but there are a lot of organizations that have a separate team, either because they have a bunch of call centers with a lot of different functionalities, and so they've decided that the workforce management uh, uh, functionality is going to be concentrated in one place or for whatever other reason. And, um, you know, there was one uh, center I was in earlier this year, and it was inbound sales. And every time that someone wanted to respond to a call, you know, let's say they had made it, gotten an inbound call, they had then called the person back, but it had to leave a message, and then they got a call back in again, and they wanted to uh, make an outbound call. They had to tell workforce management uh, not only that they were changing status, but also how much time they would need. And they found it very hard to, uh, you know, to guess on that. And what they were really annoyed about is, let's say that they made an outbound call, a call which could have even resulted in a sale, but they took a little more time. They were considered out of adherence. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, so they were kind of really annoyed about this. Well, our suggestion was, listen, uh, work with workforce management to get the button in place so that people can put themselves into outbound mode. That mode can be overridden by workforce management if there's a heavy volume of inbound calls but at least it will be a motivated override. It won't just be an automatic, you know, block in their ability to do business. They made the change, and now everybody's a lot happier. Hmm. That's an interesting story. It makes me think of, of two things, Bruce. And one of the first things that it, it uh, spurs to mind, a topic that I've uh, become very passionate about in our organization, is using a change management approach um, incorporated into how we do our workforce management practices. We happen to be a centralized team, just as you described. Um, and so as we work with groups and we, we put in policies and practices in place, oftentimes as a workforce management team, we tended to go right to implementation of those new ideas. We knew what we wanted to do, and so we would just describe what the new practice was and ask the teams to do them. But it really um, came clear through some of the, the people on, on our team. We have some very talented folks and um, some more educated in change management. And we really started to incorporate that in our approach and help the operations teams lead their own changes and understand why they wanted to update um, their practices and then share that with, with the, the rest of their team and, and change how they operated. And so that practice that you described would go over a lot better if everybody understood and then that uh, why we were doing the things that we do, not just what to do. Mm-hmm. And then the other side of that is that the, we're going after a measurement like adherence, and I think that's one of the most misunderstood measurements in workforce management, and we really have to ask ourselves why um, we're going after adherence. What is that going to, to get us by achieving an adherence metric? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Because uh, I, I feel the same way. <laughs> well, I think that adherence – itself has to be tied to the overall success of the organization. So if we understand what we're trying to achieve and how adherence influences that, then that goal should be set with regard to um, a level that gets us to that overall success. So let's not make it about compliance. Let's understand that if we do gather data and create a forecast that's accurate and therefore schedules that address that forecast, well, then those schedules, if they're optimized, now they matter. Now we really do want to work that plan. And, and until then, if they're just schedules that are fixed in place and aren't relatable to our workload uh, coming in, mm-hmm. then I don't think we have to question whether adherence really gets us anything of value at that point, and uh, are we just treating it as compliance rather than something that helps ensure success in our organization. Mm-hmm. Okay, good points, good points. Uh, Sean, I understand we have a question that's come in. Uh, yeah, this question came in via email from uh, Barbara. She asked if you can explain what you're referring to with blocked calls. Mm. Earlier. Okay. Uh, do you want to do you want to handle that one, Adam? Sure, I'd love to. Um, well, if we have uh, in part of the workforce uh, practice of forecasting and planning would be to plan how much telecom infrastructure, how many phone 
ports are we going to need to handle our call demand at our peak times? How many concurrent calls might we have in our system? Uh, often you'll hear the term T1 lines and how many T1 lines are we going to need? Well, if we do get an unexpected rush of calls that fills up every one of our call lines, the next person that calls in from the carrier is going to receive what we call a fast busy. That's a block call. The person tried to get into our system and we just didn't have room to accommodate that next caller. So obviously it never makes it into our system. We can't report against it and say that was an abandoned call or that was a call we answered. It never got there. Um, and so from that standpoint, the carrier, maybe AT&T, they would see that information and be able to provide that to us. So in other words, we can go outside of our network and say, well, did, were there people that tried to call me but couldn't get through the phone carrier uh, system to get to us? Uh, and maybe I should plan to try to handle them uh, through my next forecast. Exactly. So, Barbara, really, we're talking about busy signals here. And the thing is that those don't even get into our systems. So for most of the systems out there, you never know about them. And uh, – <laughs> So uh, the only way you're going to find out, actually, is to get that from your telecom provider. They owe it to you, so the next time you're in contact with them, uh, or make it a proactive reach out to them and say, hey, we would like to know uh, our blocked calls. Please give it to us on a monthly basis or a weekly basis or whatever is appropriate for you. Obviously, for instance, utilities will have a lot of blocked calls when there's some outage, uh, and so they, they'd like to know, you know what the, the slam is, if you will. But uh, even for other call centers, it's important to know. Great. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, Sean, I understand you have another? Uh, yes. Uh, Randall asks, uh, you talked about collaborating with different cross-functional teams. Do you have any ideas for practical application of approaching different departments to gain their buy-in? Any tools or processes other than the so-called Monday morning huddle? Hmm. Well, we actually do a separate planning meeting that isn't on Monday morning, um, and we work with those organizations to illustrate, and we, we um, share uh, our desktop so they can see how their marketing plans are going to influence the overall demand for work within our contact centers. And we can display to them what the capacity is of the groups that we work with, the contact center groups, so they can see the outcomes and the success of their um, their marketing plans, and then we can go back and share with them, did it turn out as we had forecast? But really what it gets down to is because we've shared the information, like I described earlier, what's the response rate? What did we really see with regard to the success of their marketing efforts? Um, then they're more willing to share their upcoming plans with us, and we can proactively look at that and say, does the contact center have the capacity to accommodate those marketing plans. And we have separate marketing people that come with their plans. And as you could imagine, um, we can get to times of the year where some might inadvertently cross over each other. And now we're looking at um, several plans running at the same time that might create too much demand for what our current uh, operational uh, capacity is. So it's really a win-win situation um, to have a, a meeting like that and collaborate. But we've had to develop the, um, the practice field to show and illustrate in calls exactly what that looks like. And I will say one more thing, and that's pictures tell a, a, a better story than just numbers. And so we, we graph out the call volume, how that's going to play out, and it becomes very clear to everyone involved um, what we have wrought when we put in our, our marketing plans together. And then we can uh, modify those if we need to. Yeah, no, I love that. What, what you have wrought and, uh, and the, uh, the graphics part, I think, is a really good idea. Yeah, I have what I call MKCC, which is meet, know, communicate, and collaborate. So on this, Randall, what I say is that you have to first reach up to a higher level of your organization and to convince uh, the right person up there that good communication with you, uh, among you and the others, is an extremely important thing for the success of the organization. Once you've gotten somebody at the right level to buy in on that, then you'll be able to easily arrange for meetings with the people that you need to, uh, to, to, need to get to know. You, you get to know them through the meeting, which is the K, and then uh, communicate and collaborate. So uh, then all of that becomes part of the norm, which it is in an organization like Adams, where they, on a regular basis, uh, communicate, get together, and, and know what's going on. Now, I have a fairly aggressive stance when it comes to defending the rights of call center people against the rest of the organization, and I don't really mean against, I mean uh, within, within the organization. So I think that uh, 
if you have the right person higher up, you will actually be able to convince them that you should sign off on all marketing initiatives that are going to result, that are going to have an impact on your call volumes and on the things that your agents are going to need to be able to respond on. And I don't mean a sign off in the sense of uh, you can actually um, nix something because that they won't accept, but a sign off for acknowledgement, because if they have to have as part of their normal uh, process for a marketing initiative, have your signature on it, electronic signature, then you have the heads up that you need to do a good job for them. So um, I don't think that's too aggressive. I think that's very appropriate since you're expected to uh, service what they put out or what they sort of uh, encourage to come in, if I can put it that way. Mm-hmm. I think the, um, the call center sign-off is something that uh, should be considered. Adam, do you think that's too aggressive? No, I don't. I think that, uh, you know, it, it really fits neatly into the concept that you discussed earlier, a radial organization, you know, of everybody working together and there's this mutual um, benefit. I think there's definite mutual benefit in that. And I think that what you described, you know, tongue in cheek earlier saying, hey, call center, there's a ton of calls coming your way, but we're not going to tell you. <laughs> I think we, most people have felt that pain. It's why we all can relate to that joke um, is that that's, that's something that we've all done. And so to be able to illustrate what some of the alternatives were and again, share information, you know, um, create a what's in it for me type of uh, environment where they can see a benefit, I think you'll get a lot more uh, a lot more traction when you can turn the call center into a source of information for the rest of the organization rather than just a place where calls go. Okay, great, Randall. Hopefully that uh, gives you some good ideas there. Uh, Sean, do you have another question there? Sean? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, hold on, let okay. me grab it. Uh, Joe asks, um, our contact center tracks adherence very closely. However, I don't think our scheduling is very good. Should I be concerned about this? Mm, okay, so Joe's uh, center tracks adherence closely, but he doesn't think they do a great job on scheduling. Uh, Adam, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that uh, that's a very, very common scenario, first of all. Um, I think a lot of people have heard that before, and and um, I think that with regard to workforce management, it's a unique um, metric, schedule adherence, and when we use um, a scheduling software, it's kind of one of the new toys we get out of that software. But again, we have to be very careful about how it's deployed. It has to have meaning, and I think that part of that question, um, I don't think our scheduling is very good, would lead me to believe that adherence really isn't as important when the scheduling isn't as good. And so I would, in that case, question whether we really need to um, try to go after adherence as aggressively as maybe um, Joe's organization does. So. The one thing I would say is historically we track adherence along with the outcomes in our forecast. It's one of those things we forecast and we also track to understand when we get a certain level of adherence, does that automatically or most of the time lead towards successful outcomes in the call center, like making our service level goals. In this case, without very good scheduling, I would think you might find very little, if any, correlation between those two metrics, and it might be the, the rationale to say, let's revisit how much attention we pay to adherence, and, and is it really getting us what we're after, which is successful outcomes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, those are real good thoughts. Really good. And I was just wondering, in the, uh, the survey that we took and the results that came out of it, or the result, the preliminary results that we have at this point, Are there some other uh, statistics that sort of surprise you, Adam, or that you'd like to, to comment on here? Well, I think a couple things uh, really stood out to me. One is that the, those that are using um, one of the uh, software solutions that are out there that can be bought, and I think it was characterized as an off-the-shelf solution, um, the people that are using those, it really fell into a top three uh, kind of format and responses. Uh, Aspect, TCS, um, IEX, and Blue Pumpkin really were the clear uh, majority when it comes to the solutions that are out there. One of the things, though, in, in my experience um, has been to question when we use those software solutions, are we doing are we doing everything we can to leverage it and not over relying at the same time on those uh, those solutions? And what I mean by that is. Uh, aspect IEX Blue Pumpkin. They're very powerful solutions, but you need some expert resources in your on your team to be using them correctly and to get out of them what we would hope. 
And mm-hmm. so uh, one of the other questions that you, you asked in the one minute survey, you know, was about forecasting. And when we talk about that, if you use your workforce software um, without really understanding how it creates its forecast, then you're mm-hmm. really not getting the most out of the software because you might find that it's better, as a lot of people do, to create your forecast in an outside environment, for instance, like in a, an Excel uh, environment, and then load that back into your software solution. And the reason for that would be because of some of those things we talked about with a lot of marketing efforts or things like that, that um, it wouldn't fall into a historical pattern uh, leads us towards future trends uh, type of environment that relying on your workforce software to just do your forecasting would entail. So if you have a, a, a very um, fluid environment where there are a lot of different marketing efforts and you know things are going to be slightly different from week to week, you can't just plug your phone volume into IEX and hope it spits out a good forecast because how could it? It doesn't know the other influences that are going on in your environment. And so that's one of those fundamentals, I think, that when it comes to gathering data is not just what kind of workload did we get, why did we get that? And will it repeat? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So these are powerful tools, but they have to be put in the right hands and they also have to have uh, the right inputs in order to uh, be be really effective for the organization. Uh, yeah. Great point there. And uh, Sean, I understand you have another question that's come in. I do. Uh, Rosemary asks, can Adam explain the Erlang method? <laughs> Well, I will say this because that's a that's a, a great question and it is something we spend uh, about a half a day on in the the um, workforce management class. But I will say this is the Erlang formula is um, a probability formula, and what we're trying to measure is what's the likelihood that we'll answer a call or that it will be delayed a certain amount of time. And so, uh, traditionally, it's applied against a half hour or one hour of call traffic, and then um, when we do a, a staffing model, we have to just have enough formulas loaded in that model to cover every hour of a day or every hour of a week. And so we put in the, the building blocks of a, of a staffing model are going to be uh, call volume, if we're talking about calls, average handle time, uh, shrinkage, where else does our time go, and then our service level target. What is our goal? What are we trying to achieve? And if we know those things, we can use the Erlang formula to do a really good job of, of bringing an estimate um, for staffing. But just like a software, we have to know exactly what are the, the good points and how much we can rely on it, uh, because there are some things that you can't just plug into an Erlang model and take out the answer and say, okay, that's my answer. You have to understand why you got that answer and did you set it up correctly? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think this is an important uh, point. A lot of people who are moving from the world or thinking about moving from the world of simple spreadsheets for their scheduling to a uh, more sophisticated way of doing things uh, uh, look at this airline and say, okay, is this something that's impossible to understand? It's not. It's something that can be understood and uh, can really work, uh, can be a good friend of yours, not, <laughs> not a statistical enemy. Right. And you just have to understand it properly. And uh, and also one question that we get sometimes is, uh, you know, at what size do I need to move from a spreadsheet to another way of doing my uh, my workforce management and scheduling? And, uh, you know, here uh, a lot has to do with both the number of agents as well as the complexity of the um, scheduling that you have to do. If you have plain vanilla agents that are on from nine to five, and that pretty much matches for five days a week, and that matches your call volumes perfectly, uh, then you can actually get up to a much larger organization uh, in terms of uh, just using the spreadsheets. But uh, if you get more complicated, where you have different agents, different skill sets, uh, different languages, different all kinds of uh, things that you have to uh, have to match to the volumes that are coming in, then you're going to be looking at a smaller uh, size when you want to turn uh, get over to a off-the-shelf uh, or professional package. Uh, Adam, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. I think what you said is, is absolutely right. It's very well said. I think the one thing I would add to that is the power of using some of the sophisticated software solutions at that point is you can run uh, more scenarios about what if and, and done correctly. What that can tell us is 
we can have success anywhere along the spectrum with regard to fixed or flexible schedules, for instance, but what could we do with our schedules to better address our service needs and what would that save us with regard to FTEs? It's a very powerful um, ability to, to use that software in that way, and so done correctly, that alone can help pay for the software is understanding where our savings could take us. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Sean, do we have one last question? or? I do not. You don't? Okay, okay. I thought there was something there because, uh, um, okay. Uh, well, let me ask you then, uh, how often do you think schedules should be updated, Adam? What's your thought on that? Well, I'll go back to your response to the previous question, Bruce, and talk about the complexity and, and fluidity of our environment. How much does it change from day to day and, and um, uh, those types of considerations. So when we look at our schedule practices, I think that um, some have a little bit more of a static environment or they might be hiring frequently and can kind of plug leaks that way. So I wouldn't say schedules need to be updated as often, but I would think schedule generation in most environments is best done week over week and some with some level of flexibility in our workforce. So even if 15% of our people allow us to flex um, their breaks and lunches and maybe, for instance, the days of the week that they work, that would be a wonderful thing to help match that uh, human resource supply against that uh, call demand that's coming in in a variable way. Mm -hmm. Okay, really important uh, point there. Okay, good. Well, I think we're at the bottom of the hour. And uh, Adam, I want to thank you very much, as well as everyone who, uh, who uh, sent in their questions. Uh, a really great, great session on an extremely important uh, uh, topic here. I think we covered a lot of ground. Maybe not 12 hours worth, but uh, <laughs> I think we covered a lot of ground. So really, thanks very much, Adam. It was, uh, it was great working with you. Absolutely. My pleasure, Bruce. Okay. Well, now over to uh, Sean to sign off, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Sean? Uh, sorry, Adam, I want to thank you for uh, being a co-host on the show. Uh, thanks for all your great insights. Uh, thanks to all the participants for all your questions. Uh, it was a great show. The uh, winner of our uh, in-depth reality check is uh, Barbara. Barbara, I'll send you an email of how to uh, get your in-depth reality check. The topic for our next show on August 18th is At Home Agents with our co-host uh, Steve Silver. And also wanted to remind you that um, Call Talk is now a uh, podcast. If you miss any of our shows, you can go to the website and download them, or you can subscribe to our podcasts and uh, get them downloaded to your iTunes on a weekly basis. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.